Open Paddock Rallycast. This is episode 50. That's right, we've made it to 50 Rallycast episodes. Granted, we have other episodes prior to that that weren't called Rallycast, but hey, this is episode 50 and we're excited about it. And we said we'd do something a little bit special, and so we did. This week, we have none other than America's legend in rallying, Mr. John Buffum, along with friend of the show, filmmaker extraordinaire, Warwick Patterson of Formula Photographic. It's a bit of a throwback in this show as we talk about the historics. No, we aren't making fun of John's age. <laughs> we're going to be discussing historic rallying and the 50th anniversary of John's 12th place finish in 1969 at the Monte Carlo Rally in a Porsche 911. John and filmmaker Warwick returned to the sacred coals in Monte Carlo historic. We'll be talking about that and many other subjects in rallying. This is Open Paddock, the Rally Cast. <laughs> Welcome to the 50th edition of the Open Paddock Rallycast. I'm your host, Mike Shaw, and I have to admit, I'm a bit giddy tonight. And I'm with our co-presenter, Ian Holmes, who might just explode with excitement this week with the news that, well, I guess I thought it was uh, going to be about our guest tonight, but apparently not. We got some confirmation about a special uh, thing you get to do here, Ian. <laughs> Yes, indeed. I have at long last been accepted to the uh, Rhiannon and Alex Gelsomino's co-driver academy, the Oz Rally Pro Training, uh, running a special co-driver development academy. Uh, that's at uh, the start of March. And yes, I have been selected. It's like it's like uh, saying you've been selected to public school in, uh, in England. I've been selected to Repton or Eton or somewhere like that. But yeah, yes, I'm uh, going to the co-driver development academy. I've got, uh, I've al already got a, uh, got to know my uh, my classmates uh, because uh, Rhiannon and Alex have set up a, a chat room on on Facebook uh, for us, and we've all kind of like got to know each other bef before we actually meet each other, so to speak. So I'm uh, really looking forward to working with Karina Roche and uh, Tabitha Law. Makisa Upton, Glenn Ray, and uh, Daniel Piker. Uh, all, they're all pretty, um, pr pretty successful co-drivers in their time, so in their days, and uh, yeah, I think I'm the odd one out. Well, I'm really looking forward to the information you're going to get us from the school that you're going to be doing with Oz Rally Pro, but let's move on now because we've got our special guests, Warwick Patterson and the legend that is John Buffum coming up next. Well, as we said in our opener for the show, uh, we have with us uh, Warwick Patterson, who's from Formula Photographic, who was at this Monte Carlo Historic, and the legend himself, John Buffum. First of all, gentlemen, welcome to the Open Paddock Rallycast. Howdy. Hey, great, Mike. I'm here. Well, John, we, as, as Americans that have followed Rally for a little bit, we, we've always seen you as the legend of rallying coming from the U.S. Um, you know, some of the stats here... 11-time SCCA Pro Rally Champion, NARC Champion, North American Rally Cup Champion nine times, only driver in the world to compete at at least one World Rally Championship event in five continuous decades, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. I, it, hearing all those stats, do you see yourself as a legend? I don't, I don't think of myself that way. I think of myself as an old guy that puts his pants on one leg at a time. Well, um, I, I think that would be more like racing suit than pants, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be it. No, I, I, I've uh, just sort of a branch. I know I, I stand by my record. I, I am who I am, and I've done what I've done. And if you think that's good, I appreciate that. And if, if you don't think that's so good because of this or that or whatever, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But I'm very proud of what I've done, and uh, I've enjoyed what I've done. And rallying has basically been my life, so I'm still here. So all of those things are good. Well, mm -hmm. and one thing you've managed to do is continue rallying as you've gotten older. You know, many uh, are retired and kind of done with it, but these historic rallies really kind of draw in uh, some of those that have competed in the past. And you've done several of these uh, historic rallies, haven't you? Yeah, um, over uh, 5 to 15 years ago, I've done uh, six or eight of them. I've really enjoyed it, different co-drivers been uh, basically in Europe because there really isn't much historic rallying in the in North America so we've we've done a lot of different ones and been to Norway we've done the Monte Carlo one a bunch of times and and I've enjoyed it because it's not 
the fastest one that wins, you need to have some guile and mm-hmm. you need to be able to read maps well and be able to keep time well. And as you get older, you tend to slow down some. So it fits us old guys really well. <laughs> That's putting the, the driving challenge uh, diminished a little bit because there was definitely some, even though it's like 50 kilometer an hour average speed, you still have to drive pretty hard to maintain that sometimes. It worked out, uh, as Warwick just said, that the Monty this year, it, it uh, bucketed down snow. They had to close some of the roads, one of them because of am- avalanche da- danger. And so with all the heavy snowfall, it really threw a different, a somewhat of a different aspect. And yes, even though it was 50 kilometers an hour, because of the twisty nature of the road, which is hard for an American or a North American to understand, 50, mile, 50 kilometers an hour was, was quick around these hairpin corners. Yeah, because it's um, it is it's a totally different uh, mind mindset, isn't it? To to keep an average speed up instead of like going hell for leather flat out to the finish. And uh, I think that a lot of uh, Amer- Americans who are in in the rally scene over here could get a lot out of the TSD rallies re- regularities by trying them once in a while. I think the uh, that discipline is uh, is good for people. That word is well said, the word discipline. Yes, it takes more discipline, I think, to be able to drive in a, at some exact speed than it does to go as fast as you can go. The Monte Carlo Historique, for those that don't know, Ian put up some stats here that uh, it's open to cars from, what, 1955 to, I think it's in 1979 or 80. There was 300 cars entered and they started from seven different cities. Warwick, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you saw there and uh, where you guys started from? Yeah, I wasn't really sure what to expect. I kind of went in a little bit blind. I tried to do a bit of research, um, just getting to grips of how the timing works and what is concentration lag and all those things. So it was really fascinating to see it in person. And uh, you can choose which city you want to depart from and it sort of stems back from the early days when it was you'd come from all over Europe to Monte Carlo to compete. And uh, so John chose to start in Monaco, um, and they send you off on a lengthy loop out of there, and we, everybody ends up in Valence. I thought the 80 car starting in Monaco was pretty impressive, but once they all came back and there was 300 of them, it was insane. Uh, just, you wouldn't see that in North America ever. I mean, it, it's, it's amazing how big a how big a thing historic historic rallying is. Even historic TSDs or historic rally is in Europe, isn't it? It's uh, it's quite a different thing. Yeah, it's very serious. Like it, it might be historic rally, but they take it very seriously. Because I, I heard a tale once of, uh, I don't know who it was, but uh, some American, it might even have been John, but some, some American went over one, one year and to, to compete in a, in a TSD, in a regularity, that by the end of the event, they were like, um, they, were less than a, they were less than a second out from the target time of the, uh, the whole event, yet they were like seventh or eighth. Yeah, people, the... the... The, the state of the competition, which you might expect with 320 cars uh, from all over Europe and, and other countries like America, uh, we uh, from us anyway, um, the competition is very stiff there that people know what they're doing over there. The other uh, curious thing I found, uh, actually I found it about 10 years ago, but it sort of came to light again is that there's the Monte Carlo rally for the WRC cars, but the people from Monaco, uh, the Automobile Club Monaco, Monte Carlo, they believe that the historic, the historic rally is the real Monte. And I kidded Brian Bouffier, who won the Monte Carlo six or eight years ago, I kidded him that the vrai rally, the real rally, is the historic rally. And that's because it tries to emulate times from the 60s 50s 40s 30s where cars started from all over europe and converged on monaco and they've kept that format and i think this is one of the one of the big reasons why the people especially in france and monaco think that the historic rally is the real rally 
I can imagine. I mean, just obviously look at look at how many people are involved in it. To, to me, it's almost like uh, like the Milamiglia that uh, ended up kind of having a restoration came back. Uh, just such a huge draw of people that want to come to an event like this. And of course, the cars. Uh, you, you can't talk about the historic rally without talking about the historic cars that come. And Warwick, you got to see so many of these things. Give us just an idea of some of the just the, the crazy stuff that was out there. Well, it's really neat because it's there is the crazy stuff. Like there's people running Stratos, uh, Lancias, and all sorts of amazing machinery. But then you also get guys in Mark One Golfs who are equally legitimate. They're out there running the same roads, and you got old Peugeots and little two-stroke, two-seater things. And, uh, sobs galore, I'm sure. There's the yeah, there's quite a few sobs. But it's just a really that's what I love about historic rallying is just. The variety of cars, uh, whereas WRC now most rallying is like built to a spec. They're all within fractions of a second, and uh, but that this is just so varied, and every car sounds different coming up the hill. So it's really unique. Now, John, you had a specific car you came in, uh, and it was actually an anniversary of sorts. You were there for a 50th anniversary of, I believe, your Monte Carlo run, and it was in a Porsche. Is that right? Yes, correct. Absolutely, in in all instances you just said. So I was fortunate enough as a young 25-year-old lieutenant in the Army in Germany. I had only started rallying a little bit, and I I was fortunate enough, whatever the right words are, I did Excuse me, the, the 1969 Monte Carlo Rally and a 1968 Porsche 911 and finished 12th overall, which was, if you think back, et cetera, I and mean, I can anyway, it, unbelievable that this 25-year-old pair of guys who really didn't know what they were doing or certainly were not up to the fact that this was a world championship rally or the predecessor of that Monte Carlo rally uh, finished 12th. Wow, that was unbelievable. So then time passes on. I do various things. And if we think back as an older person, like obviously I'm 75 if I was 25 then, and so I'm an old guy now, and I've done a lot of things uh, fortunately in my life. But to be able to go back and do a relatively monumental event if you think back, and maybe there's not a lot of people listening to the, to the show that are 70 years old or whatever, but if you think back, not a tennis uh, game that you had with a friend of yours, but some sort of an event that was important at the time in your 20s, and you do it again 50 years later, then you'll understand where I was and, and the pleasure and the, uh, of the atmosphere that I got 50 years later. For me, it was fantastic. Yeah, I'm. So I'm not 75. I'm. A, I'm only just turned 50. But I mean, I grew. I grew up in Europe with the with the Monte Carlo Rally, and I've read books from people who competed in the proper Monte. You see, even, see, John. Even I call call the the um historic the proper Monte because I believe I believe too that it is. But I've read books. I've autobiographies of people like Pat Moss, Carlson, and. Uh, Maurice Gatsonides, and uh, they describe yeah. what that event is actually like. And yeah, I'm just a little bit overcome by listening to you talk about this event in such such an emotional kind of way. Yeah, it, it, again, the Monte was one of the biggest, uh, certainly, if not the biggest, one of the couple biggest rallies in the world back <clears throat> in the 60s. And now there's other rallies that are equally as good, let's say, but to be able to go and do that. And it, it, it's a sensation or a feeling that I cannot impart in words to people. It, it, it's just something in myself that w- was fortunate enough to be able to say, God, I think back then I was 25 years old. That's pretty young when you're 25 years old. And I did an event as historic, let's say, as a Monte Carlo rally. And here I am with Vic Elford and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> Pauli Toivonen and, and Bjorn Valdegar and these names who Valdegar ended up winning it. And here I am with Steve Bear, and we're just the nobody. Started 85th or whatever, and uh, we actually, truth be told, we forged a letter from Harry Hung- Hanley at the SCCA to be able to say, yeah, this guy has done this rally and that rally. And they were small little rallies, but they allowed us to start on the Monte Carlo rally 
because maybe if somebody were to look back exactly at the record, they would have said, okay, this guy hasn't done anything. We're not going to allow him to start. So there's a bunch of things that sort of go unsaid, but uh, the, the feeling was fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. You know, they couldn't Google it back then, of course. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, John, I actually never really asked you this at the event, but what what contributed to you, you guys doing so well that year in 69? You know, you say that, work. that's interesting. I, I've looked back and I have I have a magazine article from six months after the 1969 event. It was like a 10 or 12 page article. And it was it was in French, but I can sort of read French and speak French a bit. And uh, I, I read through it uh, a month or so ago, and it had all the special stage times from all the special stages, et cetera. And I was so surprised. We were like 10th to 14th on, on most all of the special stages, except for the asphalt ones. They, but we only had studded tires, so that might have made sense of that. But I guess I had a good car at the time, and the 911 – We'd just gotten out of the Mini Cooper age from the earlier 60s when a smaller front-wheel drive, underpowered car was okay. And Porsche came along in 65 with a car that, instead of having 140 horsepower, 150 horsepower, had 180 horsepower, 190 maybe horsepower. We had 180 in our car. And, and so we could pull up the hills over the coals and back down the other side. It, it held its own. But I have a feeling that, that, again, we were not separated by seconds. It wasn't like the WRC is now. Now, a second here, a second there, that's really important. Back then, a minute here or a minute there was important. And I look back, and I was one to three minutes slower than the winning car, but I was still the 12th fastest guy over this special stage. So there were huge separations between people. And it was, uh, I think, more the car that was very good for the situation as opposed to my fantastic driving ability at the time. Yeah. And I think it's uh, – I've read a lot of books about Monty, but until I went and saw the roads and the, the endurance it takes to do it, you don't realize how – what an epic event it is. So, so you know, let's... we talk about this event uh, back and forth. And a couple of some people have asked me, oh, how was it? What did you think? And I've told them what I think. But I go back and I was fortunate that Warwick came over and another guy, Mark Everett, came over. And I said, look, I'm prejudiced. Ask Warwick or ask Mark Everett what they thought of the rally, because they had not been before. They've they understand what a rally is. They understand Monte Carlo, et cetera. Ask them. So Warwick can give you a really honest opinion of what he thought the event was in the overall scheme of things. Have at it, Warwick. Give us an overview. <laughs> <laughs> you open the door. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, it's really, I've been trying to put it into words because I'm trying to write this video that I shot there and trying to figure out what the story is to tell. And the word epic keep coming back up and it's such an overused word but the event starts the concentration leg which is 750 kilometers or something like that overnight taking you from your start point well even some people start in glasgow it's like an extra day for them but the whole point of that opening is to wear you out and make you tired and then you start the actual event wow um, yeah and so it's the the people who are serious about it like john and ralph were there several times before the actual event, doing notes, um, figuring out their timing. They're they're factoring in, like, why are we off by a fraction of a second here? Trying to figure out all the different variables that could result in errors in timing. And there's just so much thought that goes into this thing before you even start the event. And then when you start the event, it's almost like a relief, I think, for them. It's like, okay, now we can go and do it. But it's it's there's no straight bit of road. You're driving for four days or five days or whatever it is on pretty much the twistiest road you can find in North America for five days straight. And uh, yeah, it's just, it is epic. Now, Ralph, uh, you've run with him quite often before and uh, you've been fairly successful at Monty with him, haven't you? So uh, tell us about how you came, how you know him and, uh, and uh, how you came to meet him. 
Long story. I met him in 1969 doing the Press On Regardless rally because he was a youngster. He's younger than I am, actually, by a couple of years. But he, he was doing uh, the POR. And uh, we've just sort of stayed friends over the years. And he's very uh, – he has a really analytical, if that's the right word, mind. He's very technical. He understands problems. He wants to solve problems. So from a, from a precision standpoint – he understands what's required, and uh, from his side of the car, let's say, that's what he was able to deliver. I mean, I, I've, I co-drive in uh, TSDs, uh, stuff, but I use I use modern iPhone apps and things like that to help help me get. Uh, actually, I co I co-drive for my wife, and uh, we I use iPhone apps to help me work out speeds and things what kind of equipment did uh, does uh, does ralph use when he sat alongside you i imagine he sat there with a curter or uh, or some kind of slide or some kind of slide rule working everything out but you get what, what kind of equipment do you have in the car right well uh when we did the event 10 12 years ago the uh, curta was uh the best equipment that was allowed at the time now as of this year although they've stopped it now the last few years they allow computers so we had a time an american instrument called a time wise which mm -hmm. kept track of exact mileage and uh, exact time and you were able to compare them and he set all some lights up in front of me so that i could uh, see exactly whether i was a second early or a second half a second later whatever it happened to be but honestly because of the snow, I, I, in, in many instances, I didn't have time to look at exactly where we were. It was uh, over short periods of time. It was drive as fast as I could drive. So let's talk about those conditions because, you know, for those of us that were watching the WRC event, you know, it, it was not hardly any snow at all. Did it pretty much just the day after just suddenly just start dumping everything on the coals? Yeah, it dumped it down, <clears throat> dumped it down that day. Um, it was a Sunday, and it dumped it down. And in a couple of areas, the, the, apparently the organizers went to the local uh, police or whatever and said, let's get the roads plowed. And the police said, it's Sunday. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> so they had to cancel a couple of the stages or regularity sections because the road wasn't plowed, and it was six or eight or ten inches of new snow. And it, it was fantastic for us just to be able to drive through the snow because there was like snow everywhere. And the, the historic event spans a larger area than the WRC as well. So um, there's more, more chance for weather systems to move through and hit certain areas. So your performance in, in the event this year, it didn't, things didn't really go to plan, did they? No, we ended up having a problem with the car. It was a great, it was a great car, a 67 911, very similar to the one I had in 1969, which made it all really cool. Uh, we, um, we stickered it up to look exactly the same. I had a couple of the license plates, uh, the rally plate plus my original Army road-going license plate, and we put them on the front of the car. So really, the car looked very similar. And we went along fine. Um, did okay the first day, started in 47th place, and then moved up to 25th place. And then toward the end of the next day, uh, the, the one of the regularity starts was uphill. And we'd had a couple of problems before that, that the car uh, went on to three cylinders and would hardly run. But the, the regularity before that was downhill, so we were able to coax it into life, let's say. But the last one of the day was uphill, and we, we, we couldn't get up. We couldn't get up the hill. It wouldn't start would wouldn't pull itself up the hill so essentially we had to dnf then we came we turned around it was that we were able to go downhill met up with our service crew and came back but for me the interest that and what i wanted out of it um i got 90 percent of what i wanted the idea wasn't to finish whether i finished 10th or 100th didn't matter so much to me it was the fact that i was able to go 50 years later from when I was a, a pup, so to speak, and, and competed the same type of histo historic and semi-big-time event. That was incredible. I got to ask, actually, talking real quick just about the back when you did it when you were only 25, did you realize how big a deal it was back then? Or was it not until later that that kind of sunk in? 
Absolutely correct. You hit the nail on the head. Never really understood what a what a huge event this was. I'd done the Tri-State 24 and the Rally des Neiges in Canada. And to me, these were big events. This is a Monte Carlo rally. Oh, holy, holy unbelievable. I, no, you're absolutely right. I never understood how big an event this was in the, when I was 25 years old. John was a bit of a trooper, too, because he got pretty sick uh, right before the event. And so that whole concentration run um, just stuck through it and made it through, and he got better. And it was, that was an achievement by itself. And uh, as Ralph said, we all got croissant poisoning from that rally. <laughs> <laughs> croissant poisoning. Love it. Yeah, Love I, gave it. It, I gave the flu to everybody else. Warwick, you know, I guess you gave us a little bit of the overview there. Um, it, what's it like, though, from you know, your point of view trying to film this kind of thing with so much going on? Just knowing the volume of cars and times getting to stage, you know, whatever, that must have been a pretty big headache. Now that I've been there once, I understand it better, and I, I would be able to cover it better. Um, technically, the roads aren't closed uh, during the rally, and uh, so it was. I thought we'd get locked in; we wouldn't be able to move for 300 cars. So I didn't go into places where I thought would be good shots. So we we picked spots we could access, and. I, didn't, I don't like being on the roads anyways when the cars are coming, so that was fine with me. But yeah, it's a lot of cars, and it's like three-plus hours of cars coming through. And it's, from a photography perspective and video, I think local knowledge helps a ton, because I've seen some videos online. I'm like, oh, wow, that spot was amazing. Like, that's where everybody spins out and hits the snowbank. You just, there's thousands of kilometers of roads. You just don't know where to go. But uh, it's just fascinating sitting there on the side of the road watching Amazing car after amazing car. Sounds like uh, John's got a party going on in the background, uh, which is typical. <laughs> Everybody likes to party with Buffalo. Um, I guess, John, what I wanted to ask you is about like other uh, historic rallies. You, you've done uh, you know, several, as you said. Is there a historic rally that you haven't done that you'd like to do, like Safari or the Safari Classic or something like that? Um, no, I'm pretty happy with what I've done. Uh, but, yeah, the, uh, the uh, historic Safari is, is certainly a, a, a classic event nowadays, and uh, that would be really cool to do. I almost had a chance with Pastrana uh, five or six years ago to, to do it, and it just didn't work out, et cetera. But I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not chomping at the bit to do anything specifically now. I'm enjoying where I am. I just want to want to say, John, it's a, like you're you're the link to rallying that I grew up with as a kid in in the UK. You know, because you've competed against people like Roger Clark and Tony Pond, Stig Blomfist, people like that. Those are the people that I idolised as a child. So I, I was trying to think of some questions I could ask you about those times and uh, one thing that uh, Mike and I often talk about on the show is the great camaraderie that's in the sport today well, it doesn't matter whether it's the WRC or two wheel drive guys on a regional, ra- a regional rally here in Minnesota, there's, all, there's a great camaraderie is, was that camaraderie there back in the, those days? Yes, and, and that's a good point in in racing, I think it's more cutthroat uh, to use a single word for it. Whereas in rallying, it's always been people have been more uh, helpful and they've been more interested in the camaraderie, more interested in the people involved. And and yeah, I can remember talking to Roger Clark sitting with a bar in the middle of the RAC rally having a beer, and he said. Yeah, I don't not have a beer, and well, of course he didn't. He did not not have a beer anywhere, but um, <laughs> he we, we had a beer in the middle of the rally. He said, oh, "I just continued to do what I normally do," and and you, you can sit next to this guy who was a relatively a legend, and here I am a nothing in whatever I was, 35 years old, let's say in the 70s, and having a beer with this guy. And this is what happens in rallying, but maybe doesn't happen so much in racing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, and uh, another thing is like, uh, if I'm honest, you know, I still covet the uh, TR7, and if I, uh, in the works red, white, and blue color scheme, it's like, and you, you were in the uh, 
works British Leyland team, weren't you? You were bit, you were in a TR7. I think you shared that you were in the team with Tony Pond. Yes. Yeah. And what was the TR7 like as a rally car? Well, the, the seven was okay. It was sort of on a par, a little bit below an Escort. But then when they put the V8 engine in it, that certainly mm. helped. And it and it had great torque, had great power. But the wheelbase was really short. And I, I think. Well, there's different problems. <clears throat> One of the problems that I saw was Leyland always wanted to use parts in their inventory. So they used Leyland parts, whereas Fiat or Escort, they used what they could out of their, their Fiat or Ford inventory. But if they needed a better fuel pump, they took a fuel pump from somebody else, bought it, and put it in their car. And their cars were more uh, better developed, the wheelbase was a bit longer, and the, the balance of the car was quite a bit better. So on asphalt, the Tony Pond all, uh, did very well in a few instances uh, because he could put the 320 horsepower, let's say, down to the road, and the escorts only had 260 or 70 horsepower. Uh, so on asphalt, uh, the TR7B8 wasn't so bad. On gravel, it was a different story that the escorts, with a maybe with a slightly longer wheelbase, just handled better around the faster corners, and the TR was uh, more good power, but wouldn't go around the corner as quickly. So, uh, Warwick, uh, you've obviously got a historic car yourself. Um, uh, why don't you tell us about, uh, you've got a rally coming up, I think you're going to be competing in that in, and um, uh, tell us also, I guess for both of you guys, I also want to hear about what your favorite of the historic cars are. Yeah, so I've got first regional rally coming up in my Escort, Mark 1. Uh, I was actually just in the garage before this working on it. I never, ever thought I would have a Escort in the garage, but I just kind of stumbled into it. <laughs> um, you stumbled into a Mark 1 Escort. I, yeah. I, that doesn't sound too logical to me. There, there's a little more to that uh, story. It was uh, an Ontario, a guy in Ontario had it, um, was building it up and was kind of half finished and offered it up for sale and i initially i saw it for sale i'm like oh that'd be that'd be nice but there's no way and i slept on it overnight and the next morning i was like you know what i should i've wanted a historic rear wheel drive car this is like the ultimate one it was dirt cheap which is kind of a misnomer because you end up putting way more into it afterwards but yeah i ended up towing it back from Ontario, 3,000 miles through the winter of Canada, and four years later, finally got it on the road. Yeah, it took me four years to get the car done, um, in between being busy and sort of rethinking and re-engineering a lot of it, because we ended up undoing some of the work that had been done and redoing it. And You can get all the parts in England, but this wasn't a bone stock car, so it was a lot of engineering things to overcome. And then last fall... I finally got to drive it. We took it down to Dirtfish and clicked it into gear. And I'm like, all right, moment of truth. This thing either is amazing or it's not going to work. <laughs> and like the first two turns linked them perfectly together and like powered out of the turns. I had a huge smile on my face. And I, I understood what the Escort uh, is all about at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what engine does it have in it? It's got a two liter Pinto built by uh -huh. I Ivy Motors in Portland. Uh-huh. Because oh, I've oh it should have had a BDA in it. You can't you can't beat the sound of the Ford BDA engine. Yeah. That's... I need to mortgage my house for a BDA. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Yeah. It actually came uh, funny funny story, it came with a turbo Cosworth in it. And I was like, I do not want a light switch in my first rear wheel drive rally car. So I ended up trading that away for wiring work and paint and help with the car. I found out Afterwards, when Ken blew up the Cosworth motor for filming Jim Connor 10 at some point, uh, that motor that I had traded away ended up going to him. So the one that was in his car is the one out of my old Escort. So. Yeah, that, that motor, it turns out, like all the injectors and ECU and stuff, it was basically a 400-horsepower motor. Jeez. And that in a tiny rear-wheel drive car would have been too much of a handful. Yeah. You'd never get past quarter throttle. Yeah, I'd burn through <laughs> tires like crazy. Yeah. Um, is there a historic car that you'd like to drive that you haven't driven before, uh, and do you have a favorite? No. 
and no. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Short, simple answer. I love it. Work of all the cars you saw, was there a favorite? Uh, uh that's hard. This Stratos. You just, yeah, you have to choose a Stratos. Yeah. I I would be with you on that one. To me, it's it's still one of the most beautifully designed cars uh, I've ever seen. I mean, just way ahead of its time, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it looks like a complete handful anytime I saw one coming up the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they they do look and a I, bit squirrely at times, don't they? And I gotta say, if it was a car pre '80s that I would want to have, what car do you want to have? It'd be a Stratos, hands down. Yeah, yeah, we're all in agreement. <laughs> yeah, Stratos for the win. Yeah, definitely, it is beautiful. Just it sounds so good. Cool. Yeah, yeah. There's just so many, so many things going for it. It just, it was built to a purpose, which I love. When there's cars that, like homologation specials, just they built them for one reason, and that was to go rallying. Uh, so, John, what we want to talk about just real quick is uh, a little bit about modern rallying. Um, I want to know your opinion, just the direction the WC has gone, because uh, you've been around, obviously, rallying for a long time through many iterations, uh, as we kind of discussed earlier. Uh, what do you think of how the WC in the last couple of years has moved on to this, you know, more, higher horsepower, more aero, but very expensive uh, with limited entries versus the 2010 to 2016 era? Um, do you think it was a good move on their part to uh, go to this new kind of generation of a little bit more oomph to them? Well, it seems to work for them. Everything I've I've heard, seen written about them, that that the, the fans enjoy the extra power, the extra di- dynamics of the car. They're certainly quicker. Um, the drivers drive them so well nowadays. Um, they're so committed to the lines that they take. And the cars are really good. And yes, there's less entries, but this is a world championship event. And so if you think of the world championship events, if you think of Formula One, there's not a hundred cars that start Formula One. They're restricted because of money or because of talent, because of uh, engineering. And so maybe the World Rally Championship with only 50 cars isn't so bad because the next group of drivers uh, money engineering they can compete in a european championship event or a national championship event and and seems as though maybe that's the right way all right at work you got an opinion on it uh having seen the new generation in person they're really impressive and like john said those drivers are so committed like there, there's nobody's driving nine tenths it's 10 or 11 tenths so it's fun to watch and I think the championship has shown, like, the last two years, the battle for the championship has been amazing. So. Yeah. yeah. I've been a fan of it. I, I like the development that's gone on. I like the uh, the fact that it seems like the competition's gotten actually a little bit closer with the change. Um, yeah, there's fewer cars in it, but uh, I, I, I like the differentiation between the different brands, how they look a little more different. Granted, over time, it seems like, you know, when they start using the computational fluid dynamic stuff that they eventually start looking more and more alike right but uh but it's kind of cool to see just uh the different stuff out there um so if you got a chance uh either of you really but uh to drive one of those cars would you like to take a crack at it uh yeah Yeah, sure it'd be it'd be interesting but the problem is you cannot drive one of those cars well you can drive them but you can't drive them well unless you drive them nine or ten tenths because the arrow their aerodynamics has to come in to play, and you won't do that unless you try really hard. So, yes, it'd be interesting to try, but we we uh, regular guys wouldn't have a chance to, to show the car or feel the car in what the top champion, championship drivers can do. Yeah, I'd be happy with a ride-along. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah right I'm that right would be fine you. absolutely right yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. well john actually brings up a good point of um you know back when you were you know doing some of the you know group b era cars and whatnot and arrow was just kind of becoming a thing when it came to rallying um did it really have to change your driving style a lot because of the arrow because i mean it's kind of a reverse thinking right some corners you have to go in faster to make the corner yeah, I know nothing about Arrow, to be honest with you, because I was fortunate enough to have the, 
Group B Audis and the Group 4 and Group B Audis in their early 80s, let's say up to 84. Uh, and there was no aero then. And then Audi sort of started in, but then Peugeot made their own car. Lancia made their own car. Uh, probably Peugeot had the most aero of anybody, but um, there wasn't any aero. There, those cars were 500 horsepower cars. Get them from point, get them from one corner to out of one corner to the next, into the next corner. Then you manhandled the car around the corner and it, as quickly as you could, you accelerated down the next straightaway. So it was a point and squirt as best you could. And I can remember shooting down one corner and down this straightaway. And it's something that I saw somebody else, I don't know, five years ago or 10 years ago, uh, right, that I remember from 20 or 30 years ago. And that is what would happen is that your, your eyeballs would slightly bounce in their sockets because the suspension wasn't very good. So trying to focus on the next corner and deciding when to brake to make it around the corner was the one of the biggest problems we had. You know, uh, that, that's one thing I guess I keep trying to reiterate with uh, people from at least my external point of view. And maybe you can tell me from being there. But, you know, some people said that the new cars, you know, the danger of increasing the horsepower. But the thing is, is I guess I always think back the 1980s. In comparison today, the brakes were crap, the suspension was crap, the tires were nothing like today, and the safety inside the car is a lot better. I mean, it's a it's a whole different ball game, isn't it? it totally different. Uh, you could ask Kano, you could ask uh, whatever whoever you want. I'm sure they would say the same thing. They are totally different. Actually, I wanted to ask you this, John. Uh, have you ever had a chance to drive one of uh, Subaru's Vermont sports car machines? No, they don't let me drive them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to see it, though, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, having said that, I, up here on the ice a year ago, I did drive the car, but it was on the ice with the super spikes, and the seat wasn't exactly right. But it was it was interesting. But, but we never had sequential shifts. I, I've driven a sequential shift a couple of times, and we had, when I built the car for Antoine Lestage, the Evo 10, um, he had a sequential shift, and I tried it for a couple of short little stretches, but I, 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 we just never had sequential shifts. Mind you, we never had dog box either, so. Yeah, so it's definitely just a whole different, uh, yeah, interface into the car, I guess. And, and, of course, so much of it is so computerized, the engine cuts when you're doing the, doing the sequentials, and there's a whole lot involved, obviously, today. It was a different era comparing who was – the best i'm going to go a little bit tangent so you can cut it go out for if it. you want <laughs> so who was the best race driver who was the best golfer who was the best tennis player very very difficult to to, to because you can't compare these things and and we were just joking the other day and we're from new england so i understand but i never heard the expression goat before a year ago and now that Brady's won a sixth Super Bowl, this keeps coming up. Who's the greatest this or who's the greatest that? But who's the greatest golfer? Let's just take that. Well, somebody might say Tiger Woods, and he was fantastic. But that means you're taking Tiger Woods over uh, over Jack Nicklaus, really? Yeah, I was going to say Nicklaus would be my pick. Majors? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I would have thought, too. So, And who was the best boxer? Who was the best um, male tennis player? Well, Federer, uh, Federer may have won more than others, but maybe there was Sampras and maybe there was this person. It's difficult, but whoa, Brady sure seems. Now I realize if Brady sure seems well. Maybe he is the greatest of all time. Okay, having said that, in rallying, you can't say that they they've come up every few years. They come up with a the top ten rally drivers of all time, but that will continue to change because different people are voting on who they think. And I talked to some younger guys this weekend in our team. And I said, uh, what the hell did I say? Who was Eric Carlson? They've never heard of Eric Carlson in their life. And this is a, this is a guy who works for Vermont sports car who understands rally. They've never heard of Eric Carlson. Well, then the discussion stops right then because now we're into who do you know, whatever it happens to be. 
Yeah, every I thought I, I thought every, I thought everybody knew who Eric Carlson was. Oh well, I guess. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Oh well, I guess I guess I'm just I'm just getting too old now. So. Uh, well, I, you said it. We're... <laughs> But I mean, Carl, we can we can go off a tangent if you want. But what Carlson did driving, driving a, a Saab, an air cooled Saab, at ten tenths the way he did. I mean, yeah, he was he was a fantastic driver. Um, I guess so. We're just going to try and uh, wrap it up a little bit. Uh, so so I just had a couple other uh, questions as we kind of get to the end here. Um. Obviously, again, as we were talking about earlier, is you know, rallying's gone through so many different iterations. Um, I guess I wanted to give you kind of uh, one of the one of the questions I like to ask is kind of almost like a blank quest, blank check question. You know, uh, in a, in at least the North American rally scene, which is a little bit different than Europe, um, if there was something that we could change, uh, something to improve the sport in general, uh, maybe encourage more manufacturers in a certain way or um, whatever it is, I, you know, you've seen all these different phases of rallying. Is there anything that you can think of that you'd like to see change in our sport to, I guess, in, increase the growth? Although we have, I think, uh, capped out entries as of today uh, at 100 Acre Wood, which is good to see. But um, I, I guess what would you like to see moving forward when it comes to rallying in North America? Look, I, as you said, I've been around 30, 40 years in American rallying, and, and I've continued to say that American rallying will never be a huge overall event, motorsport event in the United States for multiple reasons. One, the country is too big. Two, the, the TV is very important and very difficult to do for a rally. Three, in no specific order, these things. Three, uh, NASCAR has a huge chunk of the pie, which is difficult to break into. Four, think about the number of events, not necessarily motorsport, but events that are vying for television coverage. There's wave jumping, there's this, there's that. And, and it's very, very difficult to get a sport that more than 1% of the population is interested in. So you combine all these things together, and I, I've said for 30 years, I don't see rallying being a huge event in general in the United States. Now, on the positive side, we... A couple of times in the past, we've fractured and had two different organizations involved. And for a small sport, that's a death knoll. So now we have USAC behind American Rally Association that ha is fortunate, I think, to have Doug Shepard, who happens to be an old co-driver of mine, who is experienced and knowledgeable and knows what's happening. So now, just starting this year, we have all the events coming back together in under one championship guise. And if it's ever going to increase slightly, now's the time it's going to start. And I guess, you know, you're talking about, you know, things for vying for attention. I think that's even more challenging now with uh, the advent of social media and other technologies that have, you know, with streaming and all that stuff that, keeps pulling people away from the regular television where it was a more of a narrow focus, even though you're vying for time, right? Now it's vying for time on a larger scale of different things. You know, it's broader, right? I, <coughs> I should have mentioned that as, as item five or item one or whatever, the younger people who are tend to be interested in extreme sports or motorsport, whatever it happens to be, you know, fun, challenging things. They're pulled away by, oh, I got to check Facebook to see if I have a thumbs up from some friend of mine. Oh, God, look, he went to the bathroom today. Isn't that great? <laughs> you know, pass that on to a friend of mine. Oh, my God, get over this. But I understand <laughs> You're not wrong. I'm an old You're guy. Wrong. Yeah, and these new guys, they're just on these things. They're wrong. But at the same time, I, I guess from my standpoint, I think social media has been a great thing for our sport where it doesn't get the TV time social media has made up for that in some scale right 
That's very true. You're you're absolutely right. That that uh, Warwick uh, TV or uh, YouTube videos are very helpful. So um, I guess that kind of leads us into you know uh, talking about I guess launch control a little bit because you know that's been a huge success. Um, you know, there's uh, in all these things vying for attention. Launch control has been a huge, huge success that Warwick's been behind it for uh, since its beginning, and you've got a new season coming up, don't you, Warwick? Yeah, and uh, season seven now, which kind of blows my mind. But uh, yeah, it's been a great venue to help tell the rally story, even if it's just mainly about one team. But that's uh, it helps get the word out there, and I think it's I think it's reaching a market that doesn't normally know about rally sometimes, which is good. Yep. And, and I guess going back to you, John, um, you know, obviously with the team, there's a little bit of a change this year. We've got uh, a Solberg coming into the team uh, f- for Subaru Motorsports. And I guess, uh, have you gotten a chance to meet Oliver and, and talk with him at all? Uh, is there any coaching involved that you're, that you're doing with that? No, first of all, yeah, the launch control is great. It gets us out to different people that might not have known anything about it or people that do know something about it and want to follow it. So the launch control is great. Uh, and, yes, we had a short tire test last fall with Oliver. And he, he's, I, I, I do not say this negatively at all. He's like a 13-year-old kid. You look at him and say, oh, yeah, bro, you know uh, <laughs> When are you going? When are you going to high school next? Uh, so he's very young looking, and he is young. He is young. His father's a former world champion, 19, uh, 2003 world champion, Petter Salberg. So Petter's obviously given him a lot of uh, teaching and coaching, and he's very, very good for his age. He won the last two Latvian championship rallies, and. It'll be great. I'm looking forward to this year. Great. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with somebody new. I'm looking forward to working with one driver is going to do six events and Pastrana will do the other two. So huge. We have David going to do them all. That's awesome. But we don't, we don't um, pick and choose Atkinson one time, Sandell one time. The car is going to look the same. Same guy, car's gonna, same guy's gonna drive it. Co-driver's gonna drive it, and th- for me, that's really good. There's like a challenge. There's a two-car team, and it'll be great. Well, I'm looking forward to see how that uh, story plays out. Uh, the young versus the seasoned, yeah, I will yeah. say for David. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, well said. <laughs> um, Uh, I guess I had one last question that actually came from uh, one of our friends, Mike Cleaver. He wanted to, I guess, ask, you know, we've always been wanting to see someone from North America get back on the world level again. And uh, I know that's, what does it take, do you think? uh, And that goes for you, Warwick, if you want to jump in too, to you've seen these guys at the world level and how they're competing. Um, what, what's really cool is right now we've got uh, Sean Johnson, Alex Cariani that are uh, competing in the JWRC right now, so that's kind of cool. But what would it take, I think, to get someone from North America to get back to that world level again, or is it just such a different ball game today? They would have to probably start in Europe. I was just going to say, yeah, exactly. send, send them to school in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> More than ever, you need. You'd have to be a thirteen to seventeen year old person in america who likes rallying done a couple little rallies and then his parents happen to take him to europe and now all of a sudden he's a birthplace american but he's been living in europe for four years and he's 21 years old and he's done 20 rallies already and you say yeah hey look this guy's from america yeah he's great yeah but not really it's just way too technical there's no well we wouldn't know we what we don't know this is a, a whether there's a 14 year old out there in america who's really interested in rallying has some really good talent inside himself that doesn't even know it and now he's going to go live in europe for 10 years that's what it takes and nobody could know that do we see that i don't see that will it happen probably not could it yeah possibly yeah, it's like when you when you live in Europe or England, like 
and you want to go rally, you can get a little Ford car, and you can rally every single weekend. Yeah. And your longest tow is maybe two hours. Wow. Yeah. And you just very different. Yeah. Well, and you go out and you're and and you're a really good driver and you got a great car and you finish twelfth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because there's eleven other guys who are. 17 year old, 17 years old to be you. Well, I must say, I you know when it, when it comes to what's going on rallying in North America right now, I, like I said, the unification of the events is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to. I mean, you know, we looked at the calendar, and if you count both regional and national events, there's an event every month from January to December. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's a great calendar, and and I I feel Doug Shepard has helped put this together. We're all about a month a month apart now, and Hundred Acre Wood has always been an attraction because it's the first event on gravel, let's call it, and now it's no longer a Rally America event; it's an ARA event. So now we got Rally America and ARA people, and they're all going. So we're going to have in the in the high number, uh, high sixties of cars. Which is a great, which which is a great number, and we're going to have. Look at who we have coming. We got the Do Vermont Sports Car Cars. We got uh, Fatella. We got uh, Barry McKenna, and we've got uh, Ken Block. Oh my God! All of a sudden, we go back now to the early 2000s when we went to Maine Forest Rally or whatever, and there were you sat at the start line and you said, "Well, there's eight guys. I don't know who's going to win. Tom Lawless going to win." Paul Schwann, you're going to win. Is uh, Seamus Burke going to win? Is and now I'm going to forget names. But there were six or eight <laughs> drivers. You didn't know who was going to win. Yeah, I think there's always a desire. Like everybody goes, like more. We need TV. We need bigger. We need sponsors and all that stuff. But I think if you step back right now, the sport is fairly healthy. Like there's some great soup. Uh, I don't even know what it's called anymore. Limited four wheel drive. There we go. Um, there's a good championship there. There's good money from Subaru. Uh, I think I think it's pretty healthy. We just need to kind of build up the entry level a little bit to feed the top end later on. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I mean, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you both out at Hundred Acre Wood, John. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll try and get some of your memories from uh, being out there. Uh, that, that historic that you did, though, wow! That I saw some of the pictures that Warwick has posted. Work. I can't wait for that video to come out. Um, mm-hmm. That's going to be one epic feature, man. Yeah, I think it's fun. I think uh, John John deserved uh, some somebody to record that feat because I don't think there's many people who can go 50 years and back to the same high profile event. And from my standpoint on the historic bet, I wanted I I looked around and I'll be honest with you, I looked around to sort of see who could chronicle this event because for me to know it. That's great. I know it or whatever. That's right. But I would somehow like to pass that on or or have something in my hand beside a few photos that I could see. So I'm so happy that Warwick in one way or another will be able to put my participation along with the fact that it's a great historic event together. And I agree with you. I'm looking really forward to it. Mm-hmm. Awesome stuff. All right, gentlemen. Well, that about wraps up our show. Thank you so much for being on with us. And uh, like I said, looking forward to uh, 2019. I agree. Great. Uh, It's good to talk with you all. We'll see you again. Well, I would like to once again thank our guests, John Buffum and Warwick Patterson, for being on the show. Great insight from these guys all the time. I always love to hear from them, uh, whether it's out on the stages, you know, from the Subaru camp or uh, in a podcast like this. They've, They've know the sport so well it's always great to get good insight uh one little note is the 100 acre wood rally has reached its cap as of today 75 entries so it is topped out in the past they can open that i think uh they'll have to look at the time it takes to run through i think the different stages and whatnot um but usually one of the reasons for a cap like that is how long it takes for the you know, mm-hmm. the stages to finish and then yeah. the cars loop around again, and volunteers being out there till midnight or something. So uh, definitely a bit of a challenge, but super excited to see an event cap out. It is, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the last one I remember capping out was uh, the first, the first rerunning of uh, Southern Ohio Forest Rally. I believe that capped out at, uh, at 70 some as well. Yeah. 
they had a, they even had a waiting list for that. And LSPR in 2015 didn't they cap out as well? So yeah, it's been a, it's uh, there have been a few cap outs, but uh, maybe we'll have a whole season of cap outs this season. <laughs> uh, that, that would be awesome. I, I'm all for it. I know that uh, Oregon Trail's capped out before. I mean, heck, I remember once we had like 81 entries or something like that. I think it was 2013 or something. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's crazy times. It's it's mm-hmm. good news though, and we're super excited for that. Um, anyways, everyone, thanks for listening to this podcast, episode 50. Remember, you can get our show on Podbean, iTunes, Google Podcasts. I actually found out Karen Jankowski listens to us through her Alexa, uh, through Amazon. So you can play play us that way. We're also on all your uh, popular social media platforms. So if you're one of those people that likes to do everything through YouTube, you can play us through there. Anyways, if you would, please subscribe, tell a friend, give us a like and a share. I'm your host, Mike Shaw. With my co-presenter and soon-to-be pro co-driver after going through the (laughs) Oz Rally Pro class. (laughs) Cheers, mate. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Have a good day.